Praise God. Can you imagine? The one who created everything, just created everything. And, and then when corruption sets in, corrupts everything, he invests himself. Who is he? He's eternal. But he invests himself into time to redeem us from this corrupted life into eternity. Amen? And it's like, gee, one day I get it. It's, it's now you can have it. Now. Amen? Praise God. And that's what the cross means. That's the resurrection that we're celebrating today. Praise the Lord. Well, let me see. I started a series and spawned off a couple other, you know, we just kind of go from one to another, but it's all, the Bible's linked together. Every passage, every, every word is just so tied together. Um, but we're talking about faith to faith, strength to strength, and glory to glory. And isn't it something that the culmination of it actually, of this message end, is number three, but it ends on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So praise the Lord. I love that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up your word, as we, as we gaze into truth, Lord God, we ask that you, the anointed one, the Christ, would give us insight, give us revelation, to give us understanding that our hearts would, would become tender to receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful day that, that, that we're reflecting on, we're looking to, we're, we're magnifying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask in Jesus' mighty name that every person here, everyone listening by radio right now, everyone listening over the Internet, wherever you are, that, that Christ would come into your life in a way that his holiness becomes profound to you. That his love becomes, it becomes gripping and comforting to you. That his grace becomes, comes elevating to you. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray and say amen and amen. Praise God. So we already talked about from faith to faith. We talked about from strength to strength, which we'll recap a little bit. But today we're going to get into From Glory to Glory, and the, I'm going to title this. I didn't put it up on the screen, but uh, we're, we're running for the prize. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 24 through 25, it says this, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. Amen? The eternal, the, the Christ, the Lord, the from everlasting to everlasting, the ancient of days. You know, there, there's, a, there's a relationship with him that we get, uh, or we get to have. It depends on if we're willing to do it his way. Amen? Remember when we started all this last year, uh, we started talking about praise and worship, which we, we call what we just went through. It's like a praise and worship time, we say, where um, there's more of a faster, exuberant song and, or songs, and, and uh, sometimes it'll just go and go, and that's fine. But it, it, what it is is that's, it's, uh, it, that's us praising him for what he's done, what he is doing, and what he will do in our lives. His interaction with us, the reality of, of, of God doing, and that's praise. That's sort of like when they go through the Red Sea, right? They, they come out of Egypt, the, Egypt, the Israel, over a million people. They come out of Egypt. There, there's mountains on the right of them, mountains on the left of them. There's a, the Red Sea is in front of them, and the Pharaoh gets ticked off, and he go, becomes this lunatic, and he gets on his chariot and brings his army, the Egyptian army, the greatest army in the world, and is coming after these servants, these servants, unarmed servants, ready to destroy him. And so... Uh, Moses said, well, just stand still and you'll see the salvation of God. And the Lord deals with him and says, what do you tell him to stand still for? Tell him to go forward. Amen? That's where, that's where the good stuff is, when we keep going forward with God. 
That's where the miracles take place, and that's exactly what happened. The, he says, smite the water with your staff. He did, and the waters parted. The, the land became dry. The ground became dry. They went across, and then God made all that. When Pharaoh started going across in his armies, all the water came in on them and drowned them all. And you know, today, you can still see the chariot wheels and the chariots and, par and different pieces of war warrior gear on the bottom of the Red Sea. Man, 4,000 years ago over. And, and it's just phenomenal what, what God has done. But afterwards, Miriam, Moses' sister, she gets the tambourine out, right? And there, all the people are singing and dancing and uh, saying that uh, um, uh, we have... You know, we've triumphed gloriously now. The horse and the rider has been thrown into the sea. The Lord my God, my strength in the song, has now become my victory. Amen. That's what praise is about. Uh, getting the victory, seeing him move in our lives, seeing him active in our lives. He's not an icon. He's not a religious icon to just be there and, and, and oh, he's out there somewhere, you know. Well, what does he do? I don't know. I was like, I went to a, I was in the Middle East and ministering and I, I, I went by this mosque and there was some, a couple ladies that came out and, and uh, I said, oh, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we were just praying. I said, well, is God going to answer your prayers? And they said, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, that's the majority of the world. It's sad to say, but that's a lot of Christians. I don't know. I'm just, just saying words. But God wants us to know. He says this. He says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. That your joy would be made full. And the Father will be glorified in this earth. He wants you to be joyful. He wants to help you. He wants to come in in, a, in an intimate way. But he doesn't want us just seeking what he can do for him, us. He wants us to seek him who he is, right? And that's worship. Worship is, is acknowledging who he is. Is finding out not what he does, but who he is. We used an example with Moses, how Moses, after they, they go into the wilderness then, and they set up a camp, and of course each one of the tribes of Israel had their station around the, around the uh, um, tabernacle that they built in the wilderness. But Moses took a tent and pitched it way out away from everybody. And he called it the tent of worship. And he said, anybody can go in there and meet with God. And anybody didn't. <laughs> Moses did. And because he did, the Bible says in, in Psalm the 104th chapter that Israel knew the acts of God. Why? Because he, he fed, get, fed them quail when they complain, after they complained. He gave them manna from heaven after they complained. He gave them water, right? From the, from, from the, uh, a, a piece of, um, a, 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 a lake that was called Mara, meaning bitter. And they even complained then about that. So he says, take this stick and throw it into it. And the water will become sweet. And it did. And that's the cross. When we bring Christ, his sacrifice, into our lives, the bitterness becomes sweet. Our lives become joyful, sweet. We start seeing him do things, but we get to know who he really is. Worship allows us to see God face to face. Now, God says, nobody will see my face and live. And I've even heard preachers preach that message. Nobody can see the face of God and live. But yet, they, if you go on in Scripture, many times he said, seek my face. And we all think physical, right? So we'll hear that verse shared at a funeral. Oh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's not what it's talking about. It means we're supposed to seek him. He wants us to see him. Because when we see him, we become like him. The parts of us that are not conducent to letting him bear fruit through us die. And they fall away. It isn't our strength anymore. It's not by the strength, our strength fulfilling the law. It's by his grace, his love, saying, here, just come to me. Isn't that what Jesus said when he came preaching in this earth? Come to me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. 
Come, take my yoke upon you. My way is easy. My burden's light. It's just seeking God, wanting to know Him. Man, I, I, just to know Him more in a greater way means I change. But I get to know Him. Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God, Acts 1, or Psalm 104 said. And he says, we're supposed to run this race. This is the race we're running. This is what we're supposed to run toward. The Lord, be like moths to a light, right? Look at Matthew 16. <clears throat> Starting in verse 24 through verse 27, Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, if anyone desire to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, you might have a life you're desiring, that you're really wanting, that you think would be the creme de la creme, right, of all lives. But he said, if you're willing to lay it down and just look for me, look to follow me, seek me. He said, I'm going to give you a life beyond what you desired. I'm going to give you a life beyond what you could imagine. In fact, in Ephesians 2, he says, it will be abundantly above and beyond all we could ever ask or imagine. A, super, a triple super superlative. Abundantly above and beyond all we could ever ask or imagine. Jesus goes on to say in verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. So he says, listen, we need to find where the real gain in life is. And that's really allowing God to have an intimate encounter with us. Giving him that pleasure. I remember once I'm going through catechism, right, and I remember somebody asked the pastor while well, we're reading our Bible and, you know, it, it, it's saying, well, how come in the Bible sometimes it says Holy Spirit and sometimes it says Holy Ghost? And he says, well, you know, the translators, they didn't want to get bored or God, maybe, I, I can't remember, God didn't want to get bored, so sometimes he put Holy Spirit and sometimes he put Holy Ghost. But the word ghost really has the, is from a foundation meaning guest. He's a Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, God, all God. But he's a guest. He needs to be invited. He needs to be welcomed. You can't live your life saying, I need this. I've got to do this. God, do for me. I'm struggling. I'm striving here. Throw me a bone, man. Give me a little help. Striving on our own. We have to lay our thing down and say, Holy Spirit, come. Whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, I'm yours. He's a guest, and he'll come. He'll never deny you. Amen? In fact, the very last chapter of the Bible, isn't that what the Bible says? And all, he says, and those who uh, uh, let the... Spirit say, come, let the bride say, come, and let all those that hear say, come. Come on, God. I want, your, I want your presence. I want to see you. I want to be changed. My life, I want to become more like you. And he'll give you abundantly above and beyond all you could ever ask or imagine. It takes courage, though, right? Somebody said, once courage is knowing it might hurt, but doing it anyway. Well, do you know that stupidity is exactly the same thing? <laughs> well, that's, that's, why, that's why life is so hard. Because in our own self, we don't know. Even when people first give their lives to the Lord, they're not familiar with the voice of God yet. They question, was that you, God, or was that just me? Or, and, the, and it's struggle in making a decision because they don't want to be wrong. But God says, you know, if you're in faith and you believe you're hearing me, I'll back you. That's why submission is so important. We think that it means 
something that it's just gives us more oppression in our life. Somebody controlling us more, but that's not true at all. The word submission is a compound word, sub and mission. Sub means under. When I was in the Navy, I was aboard the USS Thomas Edison, a submarine. And they call it that because it's under marine, underwater. I lived in New York. I lived in Brooklyn for a couple of years, and we, I would take the subway quite often. It means under the ground. Submission just means under a mission. Amen? We're under a mission. We're under this mission to let God change us, give us the greatest life possible, but beyond what we could imagine, so that He is glorified in this earth. Amen? It's not a mean ogre going to beat you in the head with a club because you, you know, did something wrong. Not going to hobble you. He'll speak to you to correct you if needed. You know that. If God, every parent that loves their child chastens their child. And the father will do the same. He's never angry. He's never mean. He's caring and loving and good. We started out with, that's why this path that God has us on, this race we're to be running, brings us from faith to faith and strength to strength and glory to glory. And that's what the Bible says. Look at in Romans, the first chapter, the 16th through the 18th verse. Faith to faith is being given totally over to God's word, by the way. I think probably I had it up there. But Romans 1, 16 through 18 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This good news. I'm not ashamed of it. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, read it, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they know the truth, but they don't want to really yield. Let God come into their life to change them and allow him to do for them. They, they, how can I trust God? I can't see him. How can I trust God? I can't feel him. I think I can do it better. I know what I want. And your vision is so small. Your ideas are so puny. Your plans are so futile compared to God. He says, the righteousness of God, growing in rightness with God, is just fellowshipping, just allowing him into your life. He says, and it's revealed from faith to faith. Now, in Romans 10, 17, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So whether you're reading your Bible, say you're, re you're, you're in the morning, which everyone, listen, you need to read your Bible. I'm surprised as I travel and, you know, even we have so many churches in our organization and I visit quite often. And uh, I'm surprised at the pastors that don't have a daily regime of reading their Bibles. People, we need to read our Bibles. Why? Faith comes by hearing the word. You don't want faith? You don't want to really be able to believe God for, for great things? Every one of us has to eat, right? What somebody once told me, well, I don't remember what I read. Well, you know what? My wife made a couple meals last year that I can't remember what they were neither. But it fed my body. It kept me going. It built me up. I'm here today because I ate the meals last year. Amen? I grew some. More visible. That's all. You have to read your Bible. You have to be fed spiritual things. We're all a natural person and, and that we have to feed this body for its health for its growth, for its nourishment. But you're mainly a spirit being. You're a spirit who has a soul and lives within this suitcase, a body. 
Without this body, God couldn't have brought us to this earth. It's the only reason we have it. And that's why Jesus constantly would, would reprimand and, and, and deal with people about, why are you so concerned about earthly things? You're a spirit, and you have to feed it. That's why coming to church, being, not getting a sermonette like Pastor Paul would say, not getting a sermonette, but getting fed. Getting fed. Getting something, not that you know all the time, but something that's going to even challenge you to get your Bible out and research. You hear this? Write, take notes and get home. Read your, look in your Bible. Check it out. Be a good Berean, right, Acts? Investigate. I call them in our college, you know, Bible investigators. They're good investigators. They want to know. They want to learn why. What's going on? Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. We have to hold on to that Word, though, because there is a real devil. And his job, the only job he has, is to try to steal the Word that's sown in your life. The thief comes to... John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, right? The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. He came to steal the word that's sown in your hearts. And so we have to keep hearing. We have to keep hearing again and again and again and again. Because then when we get out after hearing, you know you're going to be challenged. You know there's going to be things coming in your life. We're in a corrupted world. Everybody in here and everyone in the world are going to have challenges that seem to be beyond you. And so he says, I'll bring you from strength to strength. In Psalms, the, it's a, from strength to strength is being given to the assembly together of the saints, the, the house of God. It's, it's coming into a place where we need encouragement. See, I need to come to church not just to hear a message from a pastor. I need to come to church to build relationships with people that will encourage me and help me to go even during the week. I can't be with everyone, but you can get a good prayer partner. You can find people that will say, hey, you'll do great. Let's just keep going. What did God say? Remind you of that. It's kind of like a marriage, right? That's why we have witnesses stand up when, when people ha go through a marriage covenant. They're standing up to, to not to bet when your marriage is going to go, you know, end. They're standing up to be a witness of this covenant so that when you do go through problems, they say, wait a minute, I was there as a witness when God put all the love for you into that man. And I was there when God put all the love for you into that woman. I was there. You just stick with it. You keep going. There's no other love that was given. You can't say it's in someone else. It's in them. You just got to work, get close, draw closer. And you know what happens in a marriage? That's why it's such a beautiful picture of this relationship we're supposed to build with God. You're going to die to yourself. Amen? This year I'm married 50 years. Died a thousand deaths. No, I'm just kidding I married 50 years, and I had to die to myself in, in ways. And my wife had to continually go, keep going, knowing that, no, we love each other. And there's times that she had to die to herself, and I had to keep going, no, we love each other. And so a strength came in this marriage. It wasn't just fluff. It wasn't just the fluff of getting to know one another and standing at an altar, eating a good cake and having a great meal. It was building two lives together because the two are supposed to become one. Yes, that's what God wants with you. He wants you to become one with him. But guess what? He already died to himself. You're the one now.
that has to die to yourself. You're the one. I'm the one that has to die to me. Amen? I'm not all that in a bag of chips, you know. Every one of us has to grow. Everyone has to change into his likeness, into his image. The world, though, says just if there's any problems, oh, you need an education. Doesn't matter what it is. Got to go to school. Have marital problems? Oh, let's send them through a school for it. You know, not under, you're having problems with your children? Oh, more schooling. Everything's about education. They worship education. The last great, great empire that worshipped education were the Greeks. And you know that the, the capital of their country was called Lesbos? It perverted them. Education isn't the key, guys. It's building a relationship. It's, it's finding out about one another, about, about the, 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 the good things that's in that's there that's why david said think about his love think about his goodness think about the things that he's brought us through as high as the heavens above so great is the measure of our father's love that's why jesus says in the last day when there's problems when the earthquakes and the all the pestilence and and all the wars that are coming and and, and very rapidly by the way he said look up your redemption draws nigh. Colossians 3, 1 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God, not the things of this earth, because you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. We're to look, we're to focus on what's good, pure, perfect, lovely, of a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, right? Philippians 4, we think on these things, and the God of all peace who sanctifies us holy will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Ooh, man. Psalms 84, 4 through 7, he says this, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, they will still be praising thee. In other words, we have to stay together, keep together, draw together, and praise him. Give testimony of the goodness one to another. The Lord will help you out. He helped me out last year, remember? The Lord, don't worry about it. It'll be taken care of. God is going to come out on the scene. Watch. He goes on to say, fifth verse. And of course, he says, Salah means, it just means to pause and think about that. We did. Verse 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, or in you, Lord, whose, in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca. Now, the word Baca is the valley of weeping. That's what it means, valley of weeping. Place of tears, place of sorrow, tough stuff. Not the best conditions. Going through some struggled life problems. Blessed is the one, he says, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also fills the pool. How do you do that? Keep praising the Lord. Keep thanking him for the goodness that he's done. Listen to the seventh verse. Read it out loud with me. Come on. Pretend you're down south. Let's shout it out. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. Amen. Isn't that good news? Well, why would I have to be encouraged to continue in God's word? Because the devil's purpose is to steal it out of your heart. That's his job. That's his job description. Jesus said, the devil's a thief and a liar. He was from the beginning. He doesn't change. There is a real devil. There is a real hell. There is a real heaven. There is a real God, and the Father. There is a real God, the Son. And there is a real God, the Holy Spirit. And I'm living in this earth to shun hell and gain heaven. I want all that God wants for me. So I have to run this way. This is the race. 
not what we think, but what God says. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. It says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what? Patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. One translation says, let patience have its perfect work, so you'll be thoroughly furnished, entire and lacking nothing. I mean, I, I, everyone in here probably has purchased a house or rented a house or something, if you, you know, out of high school, and, and where you go to the place, and, and it's not that comfortable because you have no furniture yet. I've done that. But you get, you, to make it comfortable, you get chairs, right? And you get a refrigerator. Then it gets really comfortable. Right? Then you get a stove. Man, now we're growing in comfort. And that's where he says, let patience have its perfect work. You'll be thoroughly furnished then by God. Amen? Look at in the Message Bible. It says this, James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it a sheer gift, friends. When tests and challenges come to you from all sides, when you're under that pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Weymouth's translation says this, Reckon it nothing but joy, my brethren, whenever you find yourself hedged in by various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith leads to power of endurance. Only let endurance have perfect results so that you may become perfect and complete, deficient in nothing. Wow. Peter, in his ob observance, says in the first chapter, 6th through 8th verse, In this you're, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the great genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and what? Glory! At the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said what we were teaching. See, it's that we, go, we, we are praisers, but we also have to be worshipers. But we're, we grow in worship. Praise we can do all the time, but we grow in worship. And he says this. He says if we allow this, this trial to strengthen us, we'll, he, he'll, he'll, he, it says we will be found in praise, honor, Glory, why? At the revelation, at who he is, not what he does, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Who he really is. So we go from faith to faith, we grow from strength to strength, and if we don't go from strength to strength, we'll never ever grow from glory to glory. There was a pastor friend of mine that had a, had, a, had a, a, a brother he asked to come in and minister who was an apostle. And um, he came in and ministered. He was doing a series of messages uh, in his church. And he wanted to get to know him. He just didn't want a guest speaker. He wanted to get to know him, which is so wise, good pastor. And so he invited him over to his house to eat. But the apostle said, I, no, I, I'm, I can't go to your house. And he said, oh, okay, and they ended up going out to a restaurant. And when they're at the restaurant, he, he asked, you know, he was a little taken back by that and said, you know, I really kind of feel a little hurt that you don't want to go to my house. Well, see, this apostle was rotund. Rotund just means round. It, it, you know, it's a very polite way of saying he was overweight, way overweight. He had an issue that just caused them to get larger and larger. And he said, you know, I'd love to go to your house. He said, but you'd probably want me to sit in your best chair. You'd want, you know, you just want me to make sure you're giving me the best in your home. And if, if I sit there, it, it wouldn't be built for me. He said, see, the motel I stay in, it's built for me. These restaurants, public restaurants out here, they're built for me. But your house isn't built for me. And if I'd go in there and sit in your chair, it would break. 
then I'd be embarrassed. It would tr strain our relationship that we're just wanting to get off the ground. So to be honest with you, I can't come to your house because you're not, you didn't build it for me. A lot of people want the presence of God, but they're not willing to be built for the weight of his glory. Because trust me, there's a weight to God's glory. You'll feel it. Even now when I'm speaking to you, there's something you're saying, wow, I mean, this is, this is real. Something's going on here. It's God's glory. But can you imagine the fullness of his glory? It would crush us. I, I've been on the ground for a day. All the, the skin wore off my cheek, not just my beard, just in the carpeting. Couldn't get off. Just <clears throat> mashed to the ground. Anytime I thought I cried as much as I could cry and tried to get up again, wham, just like a lightning bolt from heaven, like a sledgehammer hitting me. Down I went again. All day. The prayer group that would meet, and we started at, you know, 6 in the morning. I was there at 4.30 that morning. By the time I, they got there, it, God's glory just hit me. Nobody would come in. They just stared in through the door in the window. But I'll tell you, after that, we had the greatest outpouring of God that I've ever been in in my life. And see, it wasn't about me, but it had to do with me. It was right after a time that oh, we, we, we went through just terrible things as a church. And came through, though, with flying colors, where I stood up for people. But see, Satan had nothing in me. Nothing to take hold of. I, I wouldn't have wished what we went through on anybody, on my enemy. I wouldn't wish it on my enemy. But there was a strength that God provided during that time that could hold some of his glory. You can have this happen in your marriage, in any relationship. But first of all, and most of all, you need to let it happen with God. What God says. It may be you reading your Bible and, and the Lord just saying, you know, start talking to you. You've got to deal with this. You, this you, you need this in your life. You've got to start doing this. And you've got to apply yourself then. And everything's going to come against you at keeping that good in your life. But you've got to keep going no matter what. When I first started living this way, we were going to church. It was in the wintertime, and uh, we lived in the Upper Peninsula. And um, uh, we, we had uh, a van that we'd pick up people to bring to church. Church was 30-some miles from where we lived. And um, the, uh, there was some people that started coming to church farther away than we were. So we said, well, here, take the van and just come on to our house. In the morning, I'll take over from there. Well, they come to the house, and we get in the van, and they said, well, your house is on fire, man. I says, I don't, so we're going to church. They said, what? You've got to put your house out. We have a chimney fire. Flames are shooting up about 20, 30 feet off the you know, chimney. I said, we're going to church. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Said we're going to church. I'm going to church. We got about four or five miles down the road. Everyone's almost crying in the van. Please, you're going to be burned. I said, all right, go turn around then. So I go get a ladder, put it on the house, get a hose. Took the hose, stuck it down the, down the chimney, turned it on, got in the van. Let's go to church. We're going to church. Yeah, I had a flooded basement. But it doesn't matter. We went to church. We did what we said we'd do. We made the commitment. And that's when God says, I need you in the ministry. <laughs> you, you, I know you'll do what I ask you to do. Look at it in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We go from glory to glory. It says this, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are, what? Read it, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. 
glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When we look, even if we see his images in a mirror, we'd be changed. That was Moses on Mount Sinai, right? He said, I want to see your face, God. He, he, he was used to worshiping him, wanting to be close to him. I want to see you, Lord. He says, nobody's seen my face and live, but just sit here in the cleft of this rock in, the, in this mountain, and I'll, I'll cover you. And when I get, I'll walk by you. When I get by you, I'll move my hand. You can see my back. And his, because just seeing his back, when he went down off the mountain, all of Israel, over a million people said, cover your face, Moses. We can't stand the, we can't bear to look at it. He glowed brighter than a light bulb. The glory of God. Look at Romans 8, 2 through 4. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which, remember, by the spirit of the Lord, will grow from glory to glory now. Everything is by the Spirit of God. Spirit is going to quicken the word to us. Revelation. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be faithful, Lord. I'm going to work at it. You know, help me out here. And we're going to have to go from strength to strength because the trial comes. Satan comes to steal the word. And as we do it, no matter what, that's why the Bible says you need to, he says, swear to your own hurt. In other words, when you make a promise, even if it's going to cost you or hurt you in the end, you promise, do it. Because there's a growth in you of strength that he's going to provide for his glory to come upon your life, to change your whole life, to change your family, to change where you work or your business. It's important to God. He wants you to have a better life. And so the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the law of our own strength, right? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, guilty as charged, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in who? Us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All His promises can be fulfilled in you. All His goodness can be delivered to you. All His blessings can be handed to you as you walk this walk, this race to the finish. Amen? Look at Isaiah 42.8. We're going to... Isn't there something already coming to the ending of this? How can that be? Oh, no, i got two more pages. Wait a minute. There we go. Just teasing. Just teasing. Isaiah 42 and 8. Look at it. Read it with me. He says this. I am the Lord. That is my name. I'm going to stop here. And that's the word Yahweh. Or we, we get the English word Jehovah. Right? Jehovah means covenant keeper, grace giver who dwells with his people. If you see, read the King James Version of the Bible... Um, I haven't, I haven't read it from cover to cover in years now, but if you read that Bible, it, you'll see it as capital L, little O, little R, little D in the Bible. But it, 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 you'll see another word, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and that one's Adonai. Adonai means owner, master, ruler. Jehovah means, or, or Yahweh means covenant keeper, grace giver who dwells with his people. There's the intimacy part. Adonai is the physical, I'm working for you, I'll do for you, I'm going to help you part. He's the redeemer. But Yahweh is the let's just cuddle up, get to know one another. I'm going to, I'm going to show you who I really am. Part. And he says this, again, for I am, read it, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. It's pretty clear, my glory, I'm not going to give to anybody. I'm not going to give to another. But remember this under the old covenant, under people that were bound by their own work, by how strong they were to fulfill what God said to do? 
one of the most grievous statements in the whole Bible when God gave Moses the three, 613 laws up on Mount Sinai, comes down and um, uh, the, he says, this is what God wants you to do. And all of Israel shouted out, we'll do it all, we'll do it. And the very, that afternoon, you know, down they go. And that isn't the key. God, I'm just going to do whatever you want. And that was when I started out, but I learned, Lord, by your strength, it's, it'll happen. Only by your strength. I, I can't do it on my own, but I'm going to follow you. I'll do, and boy, the mistakes. But it didn't matter. I mean, I, I was evangelizing. I burnt a lady's hair off evangelizing. But she got saved. I mean, I would, probably would too, you know, just get me on my... But she gave her life to the Lord. Everyone around just gave her life to the Lord. I was at ministering at a fair, a county fair. I mean, I, we could go on and on and on. I could write a book. In fact, I had people please write a book about these things. Because God come through. And it wasn't because of my perfection. It wasn't how great I am. We're going to hang around for a couple minutes. You'll know. But it's because of willingness. Confident that he'll get it done. That's why faith is just keep doing what God said to do until he shows up. Let's go to another verse. In Isaiah 48, 9 through 11, it says, He says, For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will restrain it from you, so that I don't cut you off. So here, he says, Even For my sake, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut my anger off. I'm not going to be angry at you. Tenth verse, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction. That's not physical affliction. It's not the class, but or the time, the message. But he, he, not the furnace of affliction. He, 11th verse, look at it. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned, and I will not give my glory to another? Here he says it again. Everyone on earth goes through trials. I don't care who you are. But see, when you go through trials in this earth, all you do is see how weak you are and how helpless you are. And so you reach out for people, for things, for counselors, for attorneys, for doctors. Not that they're bad, but when that's all you're seeking... For a new education, a new method, something, please, Lord. When you get born again and follow the Lord, though, his way is you just pick up your cross and follow me, just like Jesus said. You have to pick up your cross and follow me. Yes, there's going to be the same trials, but you're following me. You're going to go from faith to faith and strength to strength and glory to glory. God says, you have to become like me. You have to become like him. That's the key with God. It isn't just doing good. That Religion says, if you do good enough, you get to heaven. That's religion, right? And that's just wrong. It's not by works. It's the, you know, uh, 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 all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not by work that we're saved. That can't do it. It's by getting to know him. Lord, come into my life. Do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. Jesus is praying now, and he's praying with his apostles, and we see that in John 17. Love to read John 17, the whole chapter. It's a brilliant prayer. People say it's his high priestly prayer. I see it more as his apostolic prayer. His apostles are there, and he's praying, and look at what he says here. I have glorified you on the earth. And he's talking about the Father now. He's praying to the Father. And he says, and I have finished the work that you gave me to do. 
And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Did Jesus' prayers get answered? Yeah, never didn't get answered, right? So he says, now, I, I did what you asked me to do. I, I, I glorified you here. All that I did was to show how great you are. Now give me the glory that I had before I had to leave glory and come to this corrupted earth. And look what he goes on to say in verse 20 through 23. He says, I don't pray for these alone, meaning his apostles that were right there with him, but also for those who will believe on me through their word. Now, how many are believers in Jesus Christ? How many believe because of the words of the apostles that came after Jesus? Every one of us, right? You say, well, no, I believe the words that Jesus say. Yeah, but you just only read the red, ver red letters in your Bible? Oh, wait a minute. The apostles wrote them also. Everyone's a believer because of the apostles. He says, I'm not just praying for you guys. I'm praying for everyone that's going to believe in me because of you after I go. Look what he says. That they may be one. Here's his prayer. That they may be one. That's you and me. As, the fa as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Why is it important that the Father have us become one with him in Christ Jesus? He's going to go on and tell us. He says, and 22nd verse, read it out loud. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, and they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. Isn't that incredible? He says that I, I'm praying that they can have your glory too. But his glory, he's not going to give to anybody. You've got to become one with him. That means you better start growing in your worship. I have to start growing in my worship. I need him. I have to have face-to-face -face encounters. I have to have God counters. Where, where, where it's life-altering, life-changing. If you've been in a religious system and you never had a life-altering experience with God, man, you need that. It's yours. That's what he wants for you. So that his glory will come upon your life. Jesus, after this, he goes and prays in Gethsemane. You know what Gethsemane means? It means the olive press. It's a place where your life is crushed. Where your own will, your own desires, your own formulations of your life and future are all put to death. Gethsemane is a place where oil is excreted from the olive. In fact, the olive, after the oil is excreted, wasn't really useful to people, the animals, but the people. It was the oil, the precious oil that they wanted. See, oil is energy. Right? Oil is flavoring for food for them. And above all, oil is light. But Jesus, when he went there, listen, when he went there, remember, he didn't have to have his life crushed with the resistance like we do. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a masochist. I don't like going through the afflictions that we need to go through. But I just don't seem to willingly, oh yeah, here we go. There's this resistance. You, you, how many feel that when you end up having to get blindsided, right? But Jesus says, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Let yours be done. Remember, nobody took his life. He freely gave his life. A 
God says, I'm going to fulfill my purpose in you, or what's left of you. That's what I want to fulfill my purpose in. What's left of us after we're crushed. Because it's the oil that brings this glory. You can't negotiate a compromise with the Lord. There's no sales in the kingdom of heaven. Nothing goes on sale. This is the way, walk in it. I love Isaiah 48 where he says, listen, when you go through the water, I'll be there. When you go through the floods, I'll be with you. When you go through the fire, I'll be there. I'll hold your hand during it all, saying this is the way, walk in it. But there's good news. Because he doesn't just give us faith, tell us, oh, here's all the good things that are going to take place. Then we start out and all the problems that happen. No, we're going to keep going because God's glory is going to come then and it'll achieve it all. Amen? When Jesus was agony in, 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 in the garden, remember, he, he tells his disciples, he says, they were, remember they slept a couple times and he's in the garden and he says, now, my betrayer is coming for me. He says, so rise up now. We, we got to go. You know you have faith when you can say by the Spirit, hurry up, Judas. Right? I mean, that's got to be faith. That's faith, man. In this earth, it's the Wizard of Oz. People in this world have a Wizard of Oz mentality. I need a brain. I, I, I need understanding. Give me, I, I, I need understanding. Oh, go to the wizard. He'll give it to you. I, I need a heart. I need a heart that can't be broken. I need a heart that I can really fulfill with passion in life. And oh, go to the wizard. He'll give it to you. Oh, I need courage. That's it. I need courage. Go to the wizard. Wizard of Oz is a pure perfect story of the way of the world. In the, it's totally opposite of the way of the kingdom. God's going to lead us. The path of the righteous, the proverb says, is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter and brighter, even to the brightness of the noonday sun. God has a brilliant life for you, an incredible life. A life of resurrection, power. But you've got to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Jesus, remember, when he came, he went through all this, forsaken by everybody. Even the women, the Bible says, stood a far way off from where he was being crucified. They weren't right under the cross. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> no, they were a far way off watching what was going on. All of them. Peter denied them, cussed them out. Judas betrayed them. But Jesus didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he suffered and died because he knew this is the way to bring glory. I'm going to see that prayer fulfilled in John 17. The glory that you have, Father, give me back. But then I'm going to give it to these people that are going to believe on me. I'm making a path for them, a way for them. And he rose from the dead, destroying death, hell, and the grave. Has no bearing on your life anymore. Amen. Amen. No bearing. But it's found in Jesus, not in the wizard. In 1 Peter 5 and 10, he tells us this. After you have suffered for a little while. Now, a little while means a surrender, a little time. It's a small degree compared to the eternal weight of glory that God has to be delivered to you. 
This is his gift for you. The eternal weight of his glory. That was the end of Jesus where he said, Now, Father, I've finished your work. I went through this. Give me back that glory that I once had with you. Peter says, after you've suffered a while, the God of all grace who called you to, read it, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Do you see this? That's it. From faith to faith, strength to strength, but glory to his eternal weight of glory. In fact, look at in 2 Corinthians 4.17. You need to read this out loud with me. It says, For our light affliction, which is but a moment, works for us. Read it. Works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. All the glory that the Father has that he said, I'll never give to anybody. comes when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, in Him. And if you pick up your cross, then and follow Him. It's delivered to you. It's given to you. It's not withheld. God isn't withholding anything from you. Don't be Adam listening to the devil saying, oh, he's just withholding from you, buddy. That's why he doesn't want you to eat of this tree. No, he's saying don't go to the wizard because that's nuts. Come to me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. And the glory that the Father has will be delivered to you. The same glory. I don't know about y'all. I'm preaching myself happy up here. One last verse. Are you with me? Hebrews 12, 2. Are you getting something from this? Hebrews 12 and 2, it says this. Read it out loud. Let us... Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, that's why Resurrection Day is so important but for a Christian, but it should be every day realizing he rose from the dead to, that we could believe in him, be found in him. Not in our own righteousness, in Him, seated in the heavens together with Him, so that the Father's glory will come on you right here, right now, in this earth. You can have an encounter with God. You don't have to wait a minute. You don't have to wait a day, an hour, a week. There isn't any payment that you have that is good enough for it. You just need a desire to be like him to be changed why uh, people all the time say I give my life to the Lord but they live the same way nothing's changed they went through some religious ideology rather than really having a personal encounter with God faith comes by hearing and hearing the word and then we're supposed to go through the tests and trials from Satan trying to steal the word from our heart. A lot of times people can't even sit through 50 minutes of message. For some reason, that's a trial. <laughs> you need a desire for God. You need a true, true desire to be changed. And that's why the resurrection is so important. He redeemed us when he died, not when he rose. You were redeemed from, the, from bondage. You were redeemed from the law. You were redeemed from corruption for when he died. He paid the penalty. He ransomed you and me. But when he rose from the dead, he made the way for the glory of the Father to come upon your life. Here it is. He won't withhold it. He wants you to have it. He wants you to be the different one in the bunch. The one that has his glory on your life. Where the people say, I, I don't know if I can handle this. 
If you're in here, if you're listening right now on the internet, maybe over the radio, I, I, don't, I don't know where you are in life. It doesn't matter. If you're not in a trial, you will be. Maybe you just came out of one. Maybe there's some issues that you're going through that you're, you're, it, it isn't, it's just puzzling. And you don't have the answers. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. That guaranteed that you can have the same glory as the Father. It's like the greatest pest control in the world. <laughs> Nothing will bug you anymore. Just close your eyes right now. Now's the time to, to spend with the Lord. Just close your eyes. And if you're serious about God, if you're serious about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're serious, out of your mouth, out loud, just say with me right now, just say, God, forgive me for trying to do life on my own. I need you. I'm desperate for you. Jesus, come into my life right now. Give me a new heart. Put your spirit in me. And make me a new creation in Christ. My life now is in Christ Jesus. Help me to learn to pick up my cross and follow you so that your glory will come upon me in Jesus name and everyone said amen and amen praise God he's alive amen thank you Lord he's alive thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus we're, we're, I'm just so glad you came today, and I'm, I'm privileged to be able to speak into your life and share this truth with you. I'm not, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation. I like to share Jesus every, everywhere I go and every day. It, you need to get into a good habit. Jesus told us we're co-laboring together with him. So we're supposed to, it's not our job to pray and have him people, him bring people into the kingdom. He said, you and me, we're supposed to go out in the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Amen. So let's work together with him this week. Amen. And every week. And let's let him be glorified in our lives.